Thank you. Uh, good morning to everybody. It's my first time in Iceland, or Island, or Ireland. Not quite sure. Uh, and it came about because um, Peter, who is somewhere in the audience, came to our summit in the UK last November. And we talked about coming to Iceland, and I said, well, that sounds really interesting. I'd love to go to Iceland sometime. And then I didn't hear anything for a while, and then in the same week, I got two emails from Iceland, one from Peter and one from Daddy. And actually, although you know each other, and I understand everybody in Iceland is related, this was synchronicity, because you hadn't actually conspired to email me in the same week. Uh, this confused me, because I didn't quite know what was going on, but I took this as a signal, uh, that it was worthwhile, now was the time to come to Iceland, and so that's why I'm here. Because I have spent the last 30 years um, trying to understand this lean thing. I started off uh, at MIT uh, working with a big team, a global team, trying to document the gap in industrial practice that we observed in studying the global automotive industry. And we wrote a book called The Machine That Changed the World uh, way, way back in 1990. Uh, that suddenly hit the market at the right time and gave us a platform to not only describe the gap that we had observed in practice, but also then for Jim and I to go off and understand how to close that gap. And we then spent uh, another five years, six years, with the Publishers Advance going around the world, looking at companies that had learned directly from Toyota how to turn traditional Western practice into lean practice. And uh, we found a whole series of examples, and we wrote those up uh, in a book called Lean Thinking back in 1996. And then subsequently, we realized that we had a global, there was an interest across the world in, uh, in these ideas. And we found we had a global movement on our hands. And so we chose not to be consultants, we chose to be missionaries. And so we have spent the last 30 years building up capabilities in all the major industrial countries uh, to translate lean practice into local languages and to teach it in local languages and to act as a catalyst to provoke the development of uh, local capabilities, local examples that would demonstrate this in practice, but also would build a capability to, uh, to continue to research and develop these ideas further. And that has continued to this date. We have 17 non-profit institutes around the world in our Lean Global Network. So that's what I've been doing. I've been basically <coughs> a missionary. But in the missionary work, your task is never done because this Lean practice is a journey, as you, I'm sure, are discovering. And going down this Lean journey, uh, you realize the more you learn, the more there is to learn. And so we have continually been trying to deepen our understanding of lean practice and do that with the reference, the ability to go back when we're struggling with ideas that we think should explain what we see in this superior practice that actually don't explain it or don't lead to the same results when we try it somewhere else. And so we've always had, in the background, connections with some, some of the most experienced people who worked at Toyota uh, many, many years ago. And whenever we've gone back to them and said, well, surely this is what lean practice, this aspect of management is, is about, they react not, of course, by telling us that we're wrong. They react by asking us a question, which provokes us to realize that we were asking, we were looking at the wrong question in the wrong way. And actually, practice was 180 degrees from where we thought practice was, working from theory. And that tells us that, in fact, lean is a practice. And actually, lean is a, the application of science, the application of the scientific approach to practice, and that's why I start with these terms with this talk today. I like the word practice because the, word, the noun in the English language, the noun practice, describes what we do. 
medical practice. It is what doctors do, what managers do. That's the noun of practice. But equally important is the verb, to practice, which is I need to practice in order to become good at anything, playing the violin, a sport, anything. So it's the actual practice of learning how to practice that is really embodied in that term. So I think practice embodies the two essential characteristics of Lean, which is what we do differently and how we learn how to do things differently. So that's why I think Lean absolutely is a practice. And it's a practice that we can build consciously. Rather than taking intuitive decisions, we can take really conscious decisions. And so that's why I put these two terms together, which might be a bit, uh, a bit challenging when you first hear it, because science and management have had a tortuous history, actually. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But the image of science, to many people, is one of the steady accumulation of facts and evidence and explanations and laws that we know about. And we add to that and we write academic papers and they're peer reviewed. And it's all pretty interesting but pretty boring stuff. Actually, science is not driven by what we know. The real passion for science is actually driven by what we don't know. And a great deal of the discoveries in science have not been made through this steady, incremental accumulation of facts. It's actually been serendipitous questions, bringing disciplines together, bringing people thinking outside the box, thinking about questions in a different way, and stumbling upon things and finding things. If you read the history of medicine over the post-war period, you'll see most of the great discoveries were part of this questioning and looking for answers in places we didn't expect. So there's a tremendous book, which I urge you to read, called Ignorance, which is a restatement of the purpose of science around the passion to frame the right questions to answer the things we don't know. It's that spirit of science that I am talking about. The passion that is there, that we think we know things, but in fact there's a niggling doubt. And the trick is to frame the question in the right way, and then of course to go out and empirically test whether that question can be answered. So, that's what I mean by science, and go and read the book Ignorance, written by a, a well-known professor who invited various people to talk to his students about the things we still don't know and how we should start thinking about them. So I think that's, that's the science I'm talking about. And lean and management, I would argue, is also not about trying to prove causal laws. It's not like engineering where we're trying to discover physical laws. It is about a common using the scientific thought process to answer those questions. So it's about a common way of thinking and acting rather than trying to prove laws because every social situation, every business situation is unique. The causality is very unclear. There are multiple causes and there are multiple contexts in uh, multiple contexts that may mean that that situation, the same answer may not, it may, but it may not apply in exactly the same way in the same circumstance. So it's about a common way of thinking. Oh. And lean practice is about building a body of experience in answering those questions about what works and what doesn't. And the purpose of doing that is actually to develop a stronger knowledge base or practice base when we're facing a question and looking for the potential countermeasures to address that question. 
So it is about stronger bets, stronger hypotheses in trying to take action. So it's both about learning what doesn't work and what doesn't work, and that's often quite surprising. But it's also in helping us to guide us to search for the right countermeasures to address the right question that we frame in, uh, correctly in, uh, in the first place. So that's what I mean by science. And I think management is a practice, and we need to practice it. Just a very quick slide on the progression of management and the history of science and management. I mean, Henry Ford built upon a very long tradition that goes way back to the arsenal in Venice, uh, to making ships, to making weapons, to making all kinds of products in process sequence. And the Henry Ford, the, the Model T, was the ultimate horizontal process for a simple standardized product in which everything was synchronized right from the casting of the raw metal to the finished product off the assembly line. <coughs> multiple, multiple steps coordinated, standardized, synchronized into a horizontal flow of work. That's essentially what Ford's contribution was. Bringing together a set of different innovations, technical innovations, into an integrated horizontal process, the like of which we had not seen before. Almost no management superstructure on top of it. Ford essentially, early on, the early Ford, was essentially about the synchronization of work. Taylor, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, we are familiar with his experiments, his so-called experiments into dividing division of labor and the separation of thinking and doing. The experts will think, the doers will do. It's interesting that Taylor actually never really invented anything. And there's another great book you might read called The Management Myth, which exposes the fact that Taylor and many of the other pioneers, those experiments actually never existed. They were purely fictitious. They actually met the need for a justification of management and experts at the time. People were looking to create a profession of management. And they wanted some, a rhetoric that fulfilled that mission. And although there was a lot of argument about it, Taylorism was the basis for the justification of experts, consultants, he started essentially the consulting movement, and managers to run things and tell everybody else what to do, the flat, classic command and control structure. But Taylor himself, his experiments were completely mythical. The Hawthorne experiments, there's no evidence that those actually were ever conducted. So it was essentially about building a rhetoric to justify the experts taking the decisions and telling everybody else what to do. It was Sloan, it was Alfred Sloan that actually built the management system for the vertical control and optimization and allocation of resources in a, in a multi complex multi-business enterprise with product variety, which Ford didn't have to contend with, early, early Ford. And it was Sloan's management system that created the vertical control uh, that we associate with the command and control of Taylor, actually. And then later on, it was Porter, Michael Porter, when he switched from MIT, where he was studying competition policy, to Harvard Business School, where he was developing a framework for escaping the competition and finding super profits, premium profits. How do I escape the competition, create a part place in the market where I don't have to compete with others, I can charge a premium. That whole movement really, plus deregulation later, provided the justification for, inter for investor capitalism, we might call it. So everything driven to providing super profits for shareholders, and many of those shareholders, of course, are top management as well. And then we've got Peters, Tom Peters, the whole excellence movement, Tom Peters, Jim Collins, and so on, who spent a great deal of time trying to correlate leadership 
heroic leaders to justify the role of heroic leaders and business performance. Actually, again, there is no empirical basis for that at all. There is another tremendous book we should read called The Halo Effect by Phil Rosenzweig, which demolishes all of the scientific justifications for any of that correlation. And Tom Peters himself admitted later on the five winning principles or 15 principles or whatever he had, they were just invented one day in his office. So actually, again, this was about, like Taylor, this was about providing a rhetoric and a justification for managers earning super profits, which we've come to accept. But there is no empirical basis for it at all. And then come, along comes Toyota and says, we make people before we make cars. Now, we heard this phrase when we first encountered Toyota 25, 30 years ago. What are they talking about? This is Japanese smokescreen. Gradually, gradually, we're coming to understand the significance of that. And the significance of that is because the horizontal flow of work cannot be synchronized, actually, without the engagement of the people in the process. And the vertical control of resources also cannot also work without the engagement of everybody in the process, not just the experts and the managers and the thinkers at the top. And Toyota's found a way of combining those three. Managing the horizontal, managing the vertical, and engaging everybody. Overturning the classic Taylorist division of thinkers and doing. And that's actually what is behind making people before making cars, which I'll explain a bit more in the future. So, the contribution of Lean, the contribution of Toyota as a reference model has been that it f introduced three fundamentally new perspectives that change everything. The first and least understood is that value is defined from the perspective of the customers and users, as well as from the perspective of the investors. So it's not just maximizing business results for investors. Those results come from enabling customers and users to solve their problems using our products and services. So whether it's our immediate customer in the chain or whether it's the end customer, value is defined not by me, it's by getting into the head of the person who's using what I do and understanding what the problem is that they're trying to solve and how, using my help, they can solve it. That's hard to do, but it's fundamental. Value is decided from the perspective of the customer and the user, and they're not always the same. The person buying an SAP system is, sits at the top of the organization, dreaming that it will give them control. Illusion, illusion. But the users running a process are the ones that are subjected to all the noise when you actually try and implement the SAP system. And I'm sure you've had experience in this room of that. The second perspective is that that value that we have defined from the perspective of the end customer is actually the result. A lot of things have to happen in a lot of departments, in a lot of organizations, in the right sequence, in the right way, in the right time for that value to be delivered and for the customer to pay for it. So value is created by horizontal value streams and yet, and yet knowledge and resources are rightly deployed vertically down an organization. Toyota is as vertically organized as any other organization. Knowledge, you want a consistent application of knowledge. You want a consistent application of resources. That is a vertical characteristic of an organization. We are not demolishing that. We're saying, let's add to the vertical pyramid, let's add a fishbone diagram with all of the horizontal activities that are necessary to create the value for the customer. And to manage and to integrate that horizontal value creation process that can only be managed 
by engaging everybody in the process, by both the people who understand the process as a whole, understanding the context, but by the actual experience of those performing the work. And so we have to find a new way of engaging and experiencing uh, and engaging and, and teaching and developing the capabilities necessarily to do that in everybody. So it's essentially about value from the customer's perspective, the horizontal value stream, and engaging everybody in managing, in managing that shared value stream that they all share. Using the scientific fact-based approach. So, what does that look like? Well, we have to act at several different levels. The first level, actually, and the level we're focusing on, which is the place where value is created, the rest of the management structure is essentially there to enable and support that value stream, that sequence of steps in different departments in different companies that need to be accomplished whether it's a development of a new product, whether it's making an existing product, delivering a service, or servicing the, the ongoing use of the product by the customer. And at the front line, the focus is on creating stability, understanding the steps, understanding the causes of variation in the steps, being able to see what is planned and progress against that plan, so plan versus actual, and to spot deviations and do, to engage in problem solving of various kinds to address those causes of variation, of deviations from the plan. So it's as simple as that. It's about creating stability, about seeing deviations from the plan, and about problem solving. Now, at the middle level of the organization, here we have the classic vertical functions, and we're finding it very difficult to go across those functions. We also, in the background, have the value stream, the voice of the customer for which nobody takes responsibility. Nobody is responsible for the end-to-end -end value stream. We're all responsible for bits of it. We're all sub-optimizing pieces, our own pieces, and we're insulating it, us, ourselves against everybody else down the value stream. So we need, the big challenge is to find a way of managing the horizontal as well as managing the vertical. Toyota chief engineer concept is a great role model. Chief engineer is responsible for successive generations of a product. The concept of the product, the implementation of the product, feedback into the next generation product, and so on. Chief engineer reports at a very senior level in the organization, and yet has almost no people directly responsible working for him. He has to manage based upon articulating the need for the resources he needs to accomplish that task from the functional divisions, the functional heads. So, Interesting, difficult concept. How do I separate out the authority over the resources from the responsibility for the use of the resources? Toyota's found a way over time of gradually making that happen, of managing the horizontal as well as managing the vertical. And at the top of the organization, and this is actually even more difficult, and people are struggling with this right now, is actually being able to define the vital few, being able to see the direction the organization needs to go in, to be able to define the few things that will make the biggest difference, both to customers and to the performance of the organization, and possibly also for the employees, and maybe for society as a whole. To define the vital few things that will make the biggest difference to the organization, and focus resources on that. And I'll talk about that later, but that is management find that very hard to do. Work with a lot of big organizations who have 20, 30, 60, 80 projects, in one case 500 projects, all being launched and imagining that some of them might succeed and will force people to meet them because of targets, etc. 
Well, that's a delusion. So how do we focus on the vital few? How do we then align the activities of the vertical functions and the horizontal value streams around those objectives? How do we frame those vital few out of the knowledge of, those, of the requirements of those uh, horizontal value streams? And then how do we enable the work to be done at the front line? The whole of management is essentially about looking forward and enabling the work to take place. So we build a management system to enable the value creating process to happen. Rather than build a management system to deploy the resources from the top and somehow muddle through. So that's essentially that we have to act at all three levels. We can't act at the top and the middle without the bottom, but we can't act just at the bottom without the middle and the top as well. So here's the transformation path. And this is a recent, last year we tried to reframe the purpose of the Lean Global Network, and this is what we came up with, a small group of us. We learn Lean by solving specific business problems in their specific context. We learn it by trying to answer a business question. Not just by doing lean. We learn by doing, by solving a business problem. And we solve that business problem by building the capabilities first to, improve, to then improve the flow of work. So think about the capability pillar and the operational improvement pillar. We can, as experts, come in and solve the, operation, solve the operational problems and redesign them. But we know that as long as the experts are there, it might work, but as soon as they go, it goes back again if we haven't addressed the capability pillar. So we learn by solving business problems and developing the capabilities to improve the flow of work, enabled by leaders showing the direction and the purpose of this particular problem and the context of this problem, and by asking questions to discover what are the obstacles to performing that, the work or improving the work. And the purpose, the capabilities we're trying to do to, to develop are the, the systematic use of PDCA by everybody, the scientific approach. Actually, it's CAPD. We always actually start by capturing the results of a current situation and reflecting and framing the question before developing a plan and then implementing countermeasures. So I think of PDCA as CAPD. And that sounds great. That's another house. That's great. But so what? This is the classic sensei answer. So what? That sounds great. While the specific results in solving that problem are fine, the lasting value is the capability to solve the next set of problems. So I haven't solved, really solved, my problem if I haven't learned. And it is judging the success of the ability of the team to solve those next problems. That's how we judge the success of experts and managers and teachers after they leave. That is a very different way of judging learning or of justifying our role as consultants, if we're consultants. It isn't about generating more work and ongoing relations with the client. It's about our ability to do ourselves out of a job and build the capabilities that may result in us teaching the next generation, next set of, of, of knowledge. And it's management's responsibility to focus these actions 
on the needs of the business, of the needs of customers, on defining cust customer value, and on the needs of the business, and actually translating the process improvements that Lean generates into business results. This is often missing. Both we forget to start framing our Lean implementation around business questions, we have a budget and go and teach Lean without framing the question, but we also don't s engage management to think about how we're going to use the, the results that we will achieve by improving the process and translate those into customer value and value for the business. So, what are the capabilities? In most situations beyond the automotive industry, where the work is very largely already defined by the technical parameters of the, pro of the assembly and the manufacturing process, we have to start by, in our chaos, trying to define the vital few things that we can address. And sieving, i.e. taking a Pareto analysis of the few things that account for most of the things we do and working on them first is a very good place to start. And then linking the steps together and then beginning to create some flow within those steps, all of that focuses us on the need for stability. The classic lean sequence from a Toyota expert starting in an automotive situation is starts by creating stability. In most contexts, we have a long way to go before we can get that stability. Once you have that stability, then you can create <coughs> flow, then you can create real pull, and then you can level. And that's the actual sequence that most Toyota experts talk about. So we do that by, at every point, making, as I said, plan versus actual visual, by developing teams, very important that we have multiple perspectives in a team, and we learn how to do Kaizen. And it's management's job. The standard work for management is about both enabling the work and developing the capabilities. Those are the two tasks of management. Using Fujio, Mr. Cho, who was the chairman of Toyota, originally brought by Mr. Taichi Ono in to articulate the Toyota production system when they needed to explain it to suppliers, around go see, so facts, what is the actual situation on the ground, what is the actual experience of people managing the process, creating, respecting that knowledge, and asking why. Those are the three principles of Mr. Cho's management system. And they have been underpinned by the TWI, the training within industry, learning by doing process, which was developed during the war in the United States to teach people, teach women who were replacing the men who went off to fight to build munitions. A tremendous, a tremendous significant step in developing our learning, in a systematic learning by doing process, which was the foundation of Toyota's learning by doing process. You have the TWI process, you have the A3 process, which I'm sure many of you are now uh, using which essentially is the embodiment of PDCA and forces you to go through the disciplined process, a thought process, in addressing and solving a problem. And more recently, we have the, uh, the Toyota Kata process, which is essentially the practice that goes with that A3 thought process. It's the practice of practicing getting better and using that thought process. So I think we have a substantial foundation now of knowledge and experience and tools and practices that enable us to develop the capabilities of everybody at every level in the organization and begin to really understand what it means when Toyota says we develop people before making products. Now you might also like to think about this because you're all in management, I guess, somewhere. How do managers spend their time? We spend a lot of time focusing on the shop floor, but how do managers, who are actually a lot more expensive, how do they spend their time and when are they creating value? Actually, most management activities are, at best, 
necessary non-value-added activities. Managers don't actually change something that the customer would notice. They provide the context where that can happen. So it's interesting. Well, if we are necessary non-value-adding work, how can we improve our effectiveness? And this is interesting. If we're able to focus on the vital few and deselect, it's one of the aspects of Hoshin, one of the very important aspects of Hoshin, we can actually free up a lot of time by not doing all those unnecessary things that are never going to get finished anyhow. Second, we can, using visual, frequent stand-up meetings, daily, maybe weekly, but no, no less frequently than weekly, we can pick things up as they happen and respond to them very quickly. So we avoid all those dreadful, long <coughs> Gantt review meetings, project review meetings, which, yeah, everybody is being very skilled at hiding the bad news on slide 34 in a 60-slide presentation. Yeah, that's all game playing. It's a complete muda. If we can create stability at the value creating process we're responsible for in the project team or in the delivery process, service delivery process, whatever, and we can respond to that and, un and unbl unblock and enable things to happen and things to improve, we eliminate most of the emails, the firefighting, and so on that we otherwise spend most of our time on. So this is a way of freeing up a tremendous amount of management time to develop the capabilities of my subordinates, mentoring A3s, CATA process, Gemba learning, and so on, which is already, I've already talked about. And much more significant, thinking about preparing to meet the new challenges in the new era, and we'll talk about the web later, which is uh, fundamentally changes this and makes it more significant by designing lean solutions for the web era. So it frees up time to mentor and coach and develop the capabilities and for innovation. So I've said before, it's management's job to turn the process improvements into business results. What do I mean? Let's be very concrete about it. There are five ways in which we can improve the processes or the project management. We can close the gaps, gaps in customer value, i.e., what are, would customers really like, what are we able to deliver today in terms of quality, in terms of responsiveness, in terms of the specification of the product, whatever you like. If we, are, if we improve that, if we simply improve the quality and the delivery responsiveness, we should, with some effort, be able to turn that into increased sales. We don't think that they're connected because the sales folk don't believe the operations folk will deliver and so on and so forth. Once you can deliver, big things can happen. I've seen that. Second way is by seeing and diagnosing the whole value stream, which I'll talk about in a minute. Then we can see where it is broken as a system and we can focus our actions on where it is broken and have a big system, systemic impact. Where we can create stability and flow in value creating work, what we are essentially doing is freeing up cash by compressing time. Very significant. We don't need that additional warehouse. We don't need all of the inventories in the pipeline. We don't need all of those queues. We don't need all of the setup time involved in a poorly specifying project being worked on time and time again, bit by bit, and reworked and reworked and reworked. So it actually frees up cash from the process. Very significant benefit of lean doesn't just happen. As we align the work with real demand, as opposed to created demand, which I'll mention in a minute, uh, we find that we actually can meet that demand with, with a streamlined process with far less capacity. Or we can, using that capacity, we can meet the, the growth in demand that I talked about before. 
So that's how we reduce our fundamental cost base. And as we get better at this, what we discover is we can develop the capabilities to progress towards perfection by developing clean sheet designs for the next generation product or service that require far less capital expenditure than we thought. And that is the big ultimate benefit of Lean, is not just improving the effectiveness of what we've got today, which was designed for the era of mass production, but what we could design tomorrow using a clean sheet. Let's get on to that. So I've talked a lot about the capabilities at various different levels. Let's go to the level of seeing the horizontal process. People, and I'm sure you're familiar, you've done value stream maps of your own particular piece of the process. But I always start by looking at the whole process. I, want, I need to understand the whole process because unless we join the improvements up, we ain't going to see any delivery, delivery, deliverable benefits to the customer or improvements for the business. And that means that lean will not survive. Management's attention will go elsewhere. See, it doesn't work. So you've got to start by learning to see the system, the value stream as a complete system. And this is just a hospital. And this is what you would draw on the back of a napkin. Patient coming in on the left, patient hopefully returning cured on the right, and some of the assets in the hospital, the imaging department, the operating rooms, the, the wards. And we have a, a couple of flows, actually. We have the patient who goes in, is referred to a specialist for some tests, and then maybe goes back again. And I've just been through this whole process once. Uh, took me eight different visits to get the process done. Uh, is an elective patient, um, maybe needs imaging, maybe needs a surgical procedure, then goes and sits in a ward maybe to, to recuperate. But the biggest flow is actually the emergency patients coming in, which we cannot plan for well, can we? In fact, the flow of emergency patients is extremely predictable. But they're coming. We can't stop it. You can't schedule it. You can't change the schedule. They're coming. And they come in and they may need tests and they may occasionally need some operating. It's mainly medical. They need some medications, they need some tests, and they need some procedures. And that's the flow. Those are the flows, the big flows. Every doctor will tell you there are 635 conditions in the National Health Service. So 635 different types of medical pathways. And that's what doctors are interested in, their medical pathway. What I'm interested in is the shared resources that they all use and they all believe should be dedicated to their pathway. Uh, it doesn't quite work like that out. And critical to the patient moving, progressing from step to step to step are all these support processes, pathology, radiology, records, uh, therapies, etc. So we begin to build a picture of what this system is like. And we can see where the cues are. And we're attracted to the front end to think, well, we do work at the front end, we free up imaging, we manage the operating theaters better, we schedule patients better, all of that. And that's where most of the point improvement effort in healthcare has gone to date. But the big queue sits here at the back end. You can't see it. How do you know whether this patient is ready to go home or not? It's not visual. A third of patients, at least, are sitting there waiting, ready to go home. Could go home, but because the process isn't designed to get them out, free them up, free up the bed, um, they stay and clog the whole of the rest of the system. From a systemic point of view, if we could unblock the back end of this process, we could solve an awful lot of the other problems, all of those cues waiting to progress through the system. So my point here is not to make a point about healthcare. Every system has a different point of, a point at which you could intervene to have a big systemic impact. In healthcare, it's the back end of the process. Difficult to discover unless you walk the process and ask the questions, and then it becomes obvious. Let me take you another example. This is a, 
a classic automotive example where you take a product, you break it down into its subcomponents. This is an automotive component. And you track back through, not, through every different factory what happens going right back to the, to the foundry. And you, you track that back. And this is a real example. Lead times of something like 40 to 90 weeks lead time for those different component strands. They've come from every continent, from Brazil, from China, from Japan, from Europe, uh, and from Mexico and North America. And actually, this product travels further in man being manufactured than it does in use. And that we've often found in the aerospace industry is true. Components for an F-16 travel far farther in being made than they ever will be flown. Kind of interesting. And yet the logic of this has been low-cost sourcing and focus factories. That's why we do all of this in our factory in Germany that does this thing really well. And by the way, that's cheaper to do that in China or in Brazil. <coughs> And this is how most supply chains look currently. Next generation product, seeing this, understanding what's broken about this system, designed a, completely redesigned the work, the tooling, the location, to take the 90 weeks down to 24 days. Building products closer to customers, tight sequence, change the sequence of work, etc. So this is what I mean by seeing whole systems. Once we see whole systems, we can see that point improvements in that system would not make much difference. System-wide redesign improvements would make a huge difference and are fundamentally changing the logic by which this company decides on future investment locations. So that's two examples. I've been involved in this kind of exercise in pretty well every type of industry over the years. And in each industry, there's a tipping point. There's a point at which, if you could intervene there, you are tackling the causes of systemic var variability that are disturbing and creating chaos in the system. In the auto industry, it absolutely starts with standard work and flow. In the process industry, where you're processing maybe 250 different products through a common set of tanks and blending and packaging machines, the key there is to separate out the 5% of products that account for 50% of the volume, make those on a fixed cycle, increase the speed of the cycle, gradually incorporate more products, and now you'll find that actually instead of 160-day supply chain, that could be eight or 10 days. Not only for the high volume products, but also for the tail. So the tick is starting by separating the high volume and acting on those, and then working on the tail. In the um, retail industry, the key is actually being able to see what we call basket fulfillment, the ability to have the basket of things the customer's looking for, the basket of parts necessary to service a car, because you can't complete the service without all of the parts. It's having that basket, which is a accumulation, is a multiplication of the probabilities of each item being there. And in a supermarket, 40 items, 93%, 98% uh, availability, that's about 55% of a probability of you getting the basket, complete basket. So seeing that, and then recognizing that rapid replenishment is the only way to meet that has driven the supermarket industry to follow Toyota's example in developing a rapid response supply chain. In service industries, whether it's servicing a car, whether it's servicing your telephones, or whether it's servicing aero engines, the trick is actually to turn what is at the moment unpredictable work into predictable work. Once you've done that, then all of the other, all of the other sequence of disassembly and reassembly and so on, that is quite easy to do in a lean environment. But the dialogue with the customer to understand exactly the work to be done is where to start in that situation. In healthcare, it's making the work visible. 
The healthcare is the classic industry where anybody only sees what's the room that they're in. Making that work visible, making the fact that patients ready to go home visible, etc. That's the key starting point. In construction, I've been involved in big construction projects. The key there is to work together to change the business model, which incentivizes the bidder to bid low to get the business and to make money on the changes, is to turn that around and specify the design completely beforehand. So that there are very few changes to the process then you can synchronize the whole fabrication process and erection process. And actually, that lesson is very powerful for software as well. We launch on lots and lots of projects that have not been adequately specified beforehand, partly because we don't have a good user, a good voice of the user. We have a voice of the expert saying, this is what the system needs rather than this is what the user needs. And then all of the agile things come to play in terms of uh, rapid, replenish, uh, rapid review and rapid experimentations and modular design and so on. That's, that's the key, in my view, in, in, the, in the software business. In, the, in most administrative processes, the key, again, is to separate the created demand, the demand that is, comes in simply because the process itself is broken. Most people are ringing the bank or are communicating with the bank because they haven't, the process hasn't done what it should do. And if we can eliminate this, some call it failure demand, Toyota call it created demand, and get back to the actual demand by eliminating the root causes of that created demand, then we can dramatically simplify and probably automate many of the office processes. And in the government sector, the key isn't the processes, it's actually the synchronization of the delivery of those processes. To a long-term unemployed, they need social care, they need housing, they need job help, they need various different support. It's actually the synchronization of those which is the key. So every business is actually a collection of these different types of processes. And you've got to develop an eye for understanding what kind of process, what is the work, what kind of work are we talking about, what are the systemic implications of redesigning that work with the people in the process, absolutely. So I hope I've given you an idea that we have to take a systemic view as well as a point workflow view. And we have to think about trying to unblock the system as well as unblock the obstacles to the flow of work. And this is true in a project environment as it is in a production or a service delivery environment. This is PDCA, this is the Abea room, this is the project engineering room in Toyota. It's essentially a visual management room. And again, it is developed around clearly specifying the outcome breaking down the, the work into small increments of time and reviewing those on a regular basis. But the key here is being having a structured escalation process where on a regular basis, the top two, three issues are framed in a decision-ready fashion for escalation to the next level and very quick decision-making on, uh, on what to do about that and how to unblock that. And the other fundamental thing is actually then capturing the deviations from the plan and the causes of those deviations and capture the learning and the aha moments for the next iteration, the next, proje next round of product, project development. So actually it's PDC, we kind of get the PD bit, the check, the, ca the capturing, the learning, the responding to the learning, that we t typically miss. But it's the same, it's exactly the same kind of logic. Break the work down into small increments, review frequently, eliminate, focus on deviations, have a structured process for responding to those and capture the learning from addressing those deviations for the next cycle. Okay, finally on to the customer. 
defining value from the perspective of the customer. We can take the same process analysis, the value stream mapping analysis, to mapping any, any customer experience. In this case, it's a car service, and the car customer is represented at the top of the graph, and the provider, the car dealer at the bottom, and the interactions in between. And in this case, the, to, as is a true of about 40% of, 30 to 40% of the cases, um, the customer has to return twice because they can't, couldn't fix the car the right the first time. The point here is not the example, it's showing that we can map the customer's experience of the process and the interactions the customer have with our process, and we learn a great deal from that, both what the customer struggles to do and how we poorly fulfill the customer. But in seeing that, it tells us a lot about where our own process is broken. And again, this is another an after analysis where you pre-diagnose the work, you pre-plan the parts, you have a, a Toyota-style parts system, rapid replenishment overnight, and you plan the work and execute the work, you save a tremendous amount of time for both sides. So I'm just saying that we can take the analysis that we use in analyzing our work to analyzing our work as customers. Because we're all customers as well. And that's just the first step. Because the way I look at it, households or individuals are actually like many businesses. We have more choices to make about more things about our mobile phone packages, about communication packages, about getting our healthcare problems fixed, about getting a builder to fix something, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have more choices, more complex processes to manage, just like the complex process, relatively simple process, but it actually involves a lot more time than we remember, and we have less time. And the question is, Actually, not how can we sell the customer more of our product. The question should be, how can we help the customer create more value in their lives, meet their needs, solve their problems, manage their consumption processes better, simplify those consumption processes, using our products or our services and our knowledge to solve their problems. So it's actually the use the customer is paying for, typically not the product itself. So how are you enabling the customer to solve their problems more effectively? And the web has not only given the customers more choice and they can now have a global potential supply base, it's created informed, empowered, and impatient customers. And that's quite right. The power is shifting to customers. No question, and if you've been involved in the retail world, that is happening. But the web also means we can have a two-way dialogue with customers. Or even we can embed, embed our products with the ability to feed back information on use. Rolls-Royce, in selling power by the hour, knows what is wrong with an engine halfway flying to Singapore before the airline does. And it's then in Singapore able to marshal the appropriate response when the plane finally arrives in Singapore. We have lots and lots of opportunities for knowing our key customers and for creating feedback from use and, um, and also developing a relationship with them in which they're, going, they're willing to share plans and future needs with us. So customers actually are now an essential part of our development process. They are an essential part of our supply chains. They are no longer out there being sold. They are actually part, they need, we need to think of them as co-actors in this value stream process, in helping us develop the concept of value that we're now then going to supply to design a process to deliver. So, we now need to think back from customers, really think back from customers, rather than forward from our assets, and that's really hard. 
because we're all trying to use the assets we've been given to generate return and to be promoted and all the rest of it. Whereas, in fact, if we really think back from customers and start with a clean sheet, many of those assets probably will look very different. As I said before, that's the big benefit of Lee. We are in a position now, and this is where I think we absolutely learn from the software industry, we're in a position to run multiple experiments with different products through different channels with different types of customer groups and get rapid feedback. And understand that there is no longer one best way, one best product, even though we package it and give lots of people different options, a la mass customization. There actually is no longer one best way. There are different types of customers that want different ways of accessing your products and service to solve different types of projects, problems in different circumstances. Sometimes the same customer wants to access you in various different ways depending upon circumstances. Sometimes I use a convenience store, sometimes I buy online, sometimes I buy at the airport, sometimes I go to a big retail mall for a shopping experience, maybe. I don't do that too often, but I do go to airports quite often. So we actually need to, um, to recognize that our assets, our companies, uh, big airports, big warehouses, big stores, they're all big hospitals, they're all a legacy of the mass production age. And they will all go as we design customized solutions for different clusters of customers accessed in multiple ways. And my view is either you take this leap in understanding customer needs, how to redevelop, redesign your process and it, by developing the capabilities of your people, or a lean startup will replace you. Let me just end by reminding you of the three points I want you to take away. First is that value is, dis we have to define value from the perspective of the customers and users. And this is hard, particularly for software guys, I have to say, who are so in love with their technology. Actually, understanding me as a poor user, trying to make sense of this, is really hard. <laughs> so value is defined from the perspective of the customer or user. Then, what is the process that we construct with others to deliver that value? And how will we develop the necessary capabilities to manage that process? Those, I think, are the key questions, key insights that Lean offers. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.